Welcome back, everyone. Happy Friday. Welcome back to Spirit of Prophecy podcast. I hope you have been helped by the uh, prophecies from Ezekiel this week. We want to make sure we understand what is going on so we are prepared for anything those pre-tribbers, those Zionists are going to throw at us. We always want to be ready. And a lot of nonsense gets preached from the book of Ezekiel, ignoring context. And so very important, again, if you have not watched the previous episodes about Ezekiel, I highly recommend you go back and watch those again. I don't want to uh, review everything on there. I don't want to eat up all my time on that. we got a lot we want to cover today. And today we are going to look at chapters 40 through 48 where we have a vision of this new temple. And there are some crazy ideas out there about that. You do have some people who teach that God is going to bring sacrifices back in the millennium. Some people teach that. And part of that, too, is because these people have an Israel-based prophecy. They do not understand uh, how things were fulfilled by Christ. They take the focus off of Jesus and they put it on Israel or on an ethnicity. And as a result of that, they're thinking, well, all these things still have to happen just as laid out in Ezekiel. And no, that is not the case. It is not always that way with prophecy. Prophesy, or prophecy sometimes is showing us what could be rather than what will be. Sometimes it is what will be. Sometimes it's what could be or what should be. So we always need to check in our prophecies to see if there are contingencies. And when we get to chapters 40 through 48, I will show you a section that will always be ignored by the pre-trib crowd. And there is there's a lot of nonsense preached uh, about uh, from these passages. In fact, the picture right behind me is the Eastern Gate in Jerusalem and where Jesus rode through on a colt full of an ass. And I made a video about this on my other channel a while back that I'm probably going to re-air tomorrow for the bonus. I always do bonus episodes in the weekend. It's typically old stuff I've done on prophecy, but be watching for that tomorrow. Uh, I will be covering some of this stuff today because it is relevant, but I go into a little more detail about the Eastern Gate prophecy nonsense. And uh, I'll share that tomorrow, and I think you'll be blessed by it. But uh, we're going to go ahead and start in Ezekiel chapter 40, and I want you to notice what it says. It says, in the five and twentieth year of the captivity, in the beginning of the year, in the tenth day of the month, in the fourteenth year, after the city was smitten, in the selfsame day the hand of the Lord is upon me and brought me thither. So right there, it's identifying the time that this prophecy was given in the 5 and 20th year of our captivity. Now, keep in mind, these visions aren't necessarily in chronological order of when Ezekiel had them, because if we go to chapter 1, it was in the 30th year, in the 4th month, in the 5th day of the month, I was among the captives by the river Chebar, and the heavens were open, and I saw the visions of God. So what we are reading about here in Ezekiel chapter 40 is something he actually saw, before the events uh, that we see earlier in the book. So just kind of an interesting uh, thing to keep in mind. And so it says, And the visions of God brought me into the land of Israel and set me upon a very high mountain by which was as the frame of a city on the south. And he brought me thither, and behold, there was a man whose appearance was like the appearance of brass with a line of flax in his hand and a measuring reed. And he stood in the gate. And the man said unto me, Son of man, behold with thine eyes and hear with thine ears, And set thine heart upon all that I shall show thee, for to the intent that I might show them unto thee, art thou thou brought hither, declare all that thou seest to the house of Israel. Now, I hate to not sound spiritual, but what we are about to read, and we're not going to even go through it, it's kind of difficult. I won't say boring, but it's kind of difficult, where he's basically just giving a bunch of measurements. Now, what is this? Well, I'm going to tell you, but the scripture shows us this later. He's actually giving them instructions for the new temple. They are are in captivity. It has been prophesied they will be restored to their land. The restoration of Israel prophecies, those things happen after the Babylonian captivity. 
and also the rebuilding of the temple. Now, many people, because in the prophecies about the restoration, in the prophecies about the rebuilding of the temple, there are so many wonderful things that never happened. Many people will go to those prophecies about the restoration of the land and a lot of those things and act like they are still to come. No, that is not the case. With those prophecies about restoration, instruction was also given. However, Israel did not follow the instructions that they were given. And so we don't have to see the, you know, these things. It's got, God's not required to do all these things again. That is not the case. We have to pay attention to how things actually played out. And nobody wants to do that. They just go and they read those things. That never happened. Therefore, it's going to happen. No, absolutely not. That's not the case. And Because remember, in chapter 2, he said, Son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that hath rebelled against me. They and their fathers, they have transgressed against me unto this very day. For they are impudent children, stiff-hearted. I do send thee unto them, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, and whether they will hear, whether they will forbear, for they are a rebellious house, yet shall know that there hath been a prophet among them. God didn't want Israel to be able to say, well, we didn't know. No, God sent a prophet, a, a prophet among them. He wanted them to know that a prophet had been there. And it says, and now, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be, be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns be with thee, and thou doest well among scorpions. Be not afraid uh, uh, of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. And thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are most rebellious. But thou, son of man, hear what I say unto thee. Be not thou rebellious like to that rebellious house. Open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. And when I looked, behold, a hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was written therein. And he spread it before me, and it was written within and without, and there was written therein lamentations, mourning, and woe. So God told him, Israel's not going to listen, but they're going to know a prophet was among them. So all these things that we're, that we're reading, this was basically written as condemnation to Israel. God knew they weren't going to listen, but we can all go back and we can read these things. Israel can go back and read these things and say, you know what? We were warned. We were told what to do. We were given instruction but we didn't follow it. So when we see the promises of wonderful things that are going to come if they obey, we shouldn't be expecting those things since they didn't obey. I mean, it's just kind of common sense. But yet everyone reads this as if they obeyed, ignoring what happened. So basically, we're not going to go through and read all of it because it'd take forever. But 40 through 42 is pretty much all measurements of things involving the temple. And then uh, chapters 40, uh, but then chapter 43, this is the passage that I want everyone to see in chapter 43. This is where you could say we have our contingencies. This is where, this is the part that everyone wants to ignore. And let's make sure we get a hold of this, uh, what we're about to see here. Because we're getting, so it says, Afterward, he brought me to the gate, even to the gate that looketh toward the east. And behold, the glory of God, the God of Israel, came from the way of the east, and his voice was like the noise of many waters, and the earth shined with his glory. And it was according to the appearance of the vision, which I saw, even to the vision that I saw when I came to destroy the city. And the visions were like the vision that I saw by the river Chebar, and I fell upon my face. And the glory of the Lord came into the house by the way of the gate, whose prospect is toward the east. So the spirit took me up and brought me to the inner court and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house. And I heard him speaking unto me out of the house, the man that stood by me. And he said unto me, son of man, the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet, where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. And my holy name shall the house of Israel no more defile, neither they nor their kings by their whoredom, nor by the carcasses of their kings in their high places in their setting of their threshold by my thresholds and their post by my post and the wall between me and them, they have even defiled my holy name by their abominations that they have committed. Wherefore, I have consumed them in mine anger. And I believe that's a reference to the Babylonian captivity and destruction. Now let them put away their whoredom. Okay? Now that I've judged them, 
Here's some instructions for them while they're in captivity. Let them put away their whoredom in the carcasses of their kings far from me, and I will dwell in the midst of them forever. Thou son of man, show the house to the house of Israel that they may be ashamed of their iniquities and let them measure the pattern. And if they be ashamed of all that they have done, show them the form of the house and the fashion thereof and the goings out thereof and the comings in thereof and all the forms thereof and all the ordinances thereof and all the forms thereof and all the laws thereof and write it in their sight that they may keep the whole form thereof and all the ordinances thereof and do them. This is the law of the house upon the top of the holy mountain. The whole limit thereof round about shall be most holy. Behold, this is the law of the house. Right here is where we understand what's going on. God is given is all these visions we're seeing, all these measurements. God's giving them instructions for the temple on how to rebuild the temple. Now, I've never taken the time to do this, but people will tell you about how glorious this temple is going to be. If you look at the measurements, it's going to be huge. This was much bigger than what they actually built. And it is true that what they built was very inferior to this. But understand, too, a part of that was due to their disobedience. And I'm not going to take time to go to the scriptures, but the Zerubbabel temple was very much inferior to the uh, Solomon's temple, for sure. And that is why the ancient men, they wept when they laid the foundation of it. While the young men who hadn't seen the old temple, they shouted. They thought, well, this is great. But the old men who'd seen the former temple, uh, they knew. Uh, they knew. And there are there's other places, too, where it's even more clear that uh, this temple was inferior. It was inside as nothing. And so um, these. So what we're about to see in this passage is instructions preparing Israel for the Messiah. Now, Ezekiel is not the only one who prophesied about this temple and about the coming of the Messiah. Zechariah also prophesied about that. We'll probably do some episodes one of these days just on the Zechariah prophecies that are also butchered, that everyone preaches as if Israel obeyed, and there are contingencies in Zechariah. And everybody ignores them, and they act like Israel obeyed. No, Israel didn't obey. So, uh, we shouldn't expect it to play out exactly the same way. But basically, here in chapter 43, uh, he's showing them what this is all about. And notice, too, here's, and let me show you the contingency that was in there. It says, um, and if they be ashamed of all that they have done, okay, they are supposed to be ashamed of the things that they have done, if they be ashamed of all that they have done. But Israel, unfortunately, they were not very good at being ashamed like they should have. And they also were to follow the instructions that are given. And we're not going to go through all those things, but there was a lot of instructions that were given. Now, I do want to point out chapter 44. Now, this is what tomorrow's video will be about where, I'll go in, uh, where I go into more detail. But I do want to briefly cover this because there's a lot of nonsense that is taught from Ezekiel chapter 44 where people uh, will read this stuff and they will act as if uh, these things are still to come. But it says, Then brought me back the way of the gate of the outward sanctuary, with look at, which looketh toward the east, and it was shut. And does anybody notice anything interesting about this gate, gate that faced the east? It's shut. It's sealed up. That's a fulfillment of Bible prophecy right there. And so uh, notice what it says in verse 2. And the Lord, uh, Lord said unto me, This gate shall be shut, and it shall not be open, and no man shall enter in by it, because the Lord, the God of Israel, hath entered in by it. Therefore, it shall be shut. It is for the prince. The prince, he shall sit in it to eat bread before the Lord. He shall enter in by the way of the porch of the gate, and shall go out by the way of the same. And so right there, people will use that and they will talk about, you know, the prophecy, the sealing up of the gate. And I didn't have it on the scripture. And one of these days, the Messiah, he is going to come through the porch of that gate and that door is going to be open. And, and they just kind of come up with all kinds of 
kind of weird speculation on all, all these things, but here's what they also fail to do. They'll isolate that passage, act like this is something that's still to come, and they'll ignore the history of this gate. Now, the gate behind me, I'm not going to repeat all this. You'll see it on tomorrow's video. This gate has, first off, this gate wasn't even there during the time of Christ, uh, and no one denies that. This was built, what you're looking at behind me was built hundreds of years later, okay? And throughout history, it has been opened more than once. It has been opened and sealed up more than once. So, uh, you know, right here, um, right here, you can see the back part of that gate, you know, where it's all sealed up. But anyway, you'll uh, you'll see my video on that tomorrow. But just understand, um, yeah, this doesn't make any sense. So people tell you that gate can't be open until the Messiah comes through. No, no, this Ezekiel 44 prophecy has already had a fulfillment. But what everybody does, they ignore the rest of chapter 44 where more instruction is given for the Levites. And this is so important. It goes into great detail. The prophecies that we are seeing in Ezekiel 40 through 48 are very detailed. And these are briefly mentioned in Malachi, in Zechariah. But Ezekiel is where we get the real details of these things that are very important. And in chapter 45, he's giving the Levites instructions on what they can do to prepare for when the Messiah comes through that eastern gate and comes into the temple. Now, Malachi 3 gives us a much more brief summary of these events. Now, let's go to Malachi chapter 3 and see what he had to say. He says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and a fuller's soap. And he shall purify, um, uh, and he shall sit as a refiner and purify of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old, as in the former years, and I will come near to you to judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against the false swearers and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his right, and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, without preaching all through the book of Malachi, understand when Malachi was written, the temple had been rebuilt. The sacrifices had been reinstituted. But Israel was not following the instructions like they were supposed to. And Malachi is giving them one rebuke after another for the things they were doing. They were robbing God of their tithes and offerings. They were offering the lame. They weren't offering the best. They weren't doing the things that they were supposed to do. And Malachi is trying to correct these things. And the book of Malachi ends with a prophecy about uh, you know, Elias, well, that was fulfilled through John the Baptist. So he would come and prepare the way of the Lord. And Jesus came and he did suddenly come into his temple on the day of visitation. Let's look at Sunday's message uh, um, at the triumphal entry. That was his coming. But did when he went into the temple, did he purify the sons of Levi? Did he offer up in a sacrifice with them? Did, did he do any of the things we see in Ezekiel 40 through 48? We do see him coming through the gate. That happened, but Israel did not follow the instructions of Ezekiel 40 through 48. They had not done what God had told them to do. And there's a lot of references to this prince and all these things that he was going to do. Chapter 45 is specific instructions about the offerings for the Messiah. 46 is more instructions about what they were supposed to do when the prince came through the gate. They didn't do those things. Why do you think Jesus wept over the city when he came through there? They were not ready for his coming. They were not ready. We ignore that. Nobody wants to talk about what did it mean to be ready for his coming in that day. Well, Ezekiel 40 through 48 tells us a lot of it. Malachi tells us a lot of it. Zechariah tells us a lot about it. I'm telling you, all these prophecies about the restoration to Israel and the rebuilding of the temple, these were 
not just prophecies about what was to come, but they were instructions about what they were supposed to do. In chapter 47, we see a stream coming from the house of the Lord and where it heals the waters of Engedi. Uh, and uh, and that's some teach that that's going to happen in the millennium, and it might. I'm not positive that that even has to happen. And I'll explain why in a little bit. That, that might happen. If you go to Israel today, uh, to the Gihon Springs, that's where the temple was at one time. There's water coming from there. One of these days, I personally think uh, that water is going to come even more. And it's going to, there's going to, the Mount of Olives is going to split and there's going to be a valley and that water is going to go uh, to the Dead Sea, like is described in Ezekiel 47, but it doesn't really have to. And, I'll, and, and we'll talk about why here in a little bit. I'll, I'll show you why in a little bit. But Ezekiel 47, um, in verse 21, it says, So shall ye divide this land unto you according to the tribes of Israel. And it shall come to pass that ye shall divide it by lot for an inheritance unto you and to the strangers that sojourn among you. Let me get this up on the screen for you because this is, this is pretty important stuff that is also um, ignored. Okay, And this is going to be a subject for another day, but I'm going to briefly tease you with this. And, it sa- and so uh, it's talking about their borders. And it says, and it shall come to pass that ye shall divide it by lot for inheritance unto you, and to the strangers that sojourn among you, which shall beget children among you. And they shall be unto you as born in the country among the children of Israel. They shall have an inheritance with you among the tribes of Israel. And it shall come to pass that in what tribe the stranger sojourneth, there shall ye give him his inheritance, saith the Lord God. Understand that it was... Part of their instruction when they rebuilt the temple is they were supposed to be making it a house of prayer for all nations. Jesus brought that up at his coming, at the day of visitation. He went in there and said, my house should be called a house of prayer for all nations. But ye have made it into a den of thieves. There weren't people from all nations there. There were only Jews who were sinful. They had not followed the instructions that God had given. And this just goes to show, too, it was never about bloodlines. God said, these strangers that sojourn among you, you it's like, well, what tribe are they going to be in? Whichever one they're dwelling in. If they're dwelling in Manasseh, they're Manasseh. If they're dwelling in Judah, they're Judah. That was God's instruction for them. Now, Israel did not do that. And let me just tease you a little bit and, and blow your tops. Most of you, when you read Nehemiah, it's all just preaching about, let's build the wall. And, it's, we, and we use it for church building and stuff like that. Build the wall, amen? Nehemiah. But remember the people who wanted to help them? And don't get me wrong, they were wicked people. Okay, Those people who wanted to help them and serve their gods, who they rejected, okay, who had a bad practice, they had all kinds of problems. They ended up becoming their enemies. Those people ended up becoming what was known in the New Testament as the Samaritans. Because they were rejected from that worship, they did. They just had their own that they did that was wrong. But let me, I'm here today to tell you they should have allowed them to help. Now, they should have forced them to follow their laws and to follow their customs and all the things that God commanded them to do. But God wanted strangers to be a part of that new temple system. And Israel disobeyed. That was just one more area where Israel disobeyed. And so I'll I'll cover that one of these days, but that is super important to understand the doctrinal significance of what was going on there. Uh, But most people don't pay attention to it. They think, good, yeah, I don't let those people, they're not Jews. Hey, have you ever read Ezekiel 40 through 48 and applied it to that day instead of in the future? If you did, you would understand exactly what was going on. And because of that rejection, that just created a hostility that grew and it caused all kinds of problems. I, I think you know some of those people uh, could have got their heart right and you know, it could have been a good thing for Israel. But anyway, that's a subject for another day. But basically, what, what, what you're reading in Ezekiel 40 through 48 are instructions for the new temple, instructions for some it, the practices, a way to include strangers, instructions for when the Messiah comes, 
I mean, very detailed instructions. These are all holy things. These are all basically what Israel does if they obey. And again, God knew they weren't going to. But we do need to ask ourselves the question, what would it have looked like if Israel would have obeyed? And we don't want to start with, you know, the triumphal entry and say what would have happened if they would have accepted him then. They were already so far gone that it wasn't even funny. When they were supposed to start preparing themselves, it was when they rebuilt their temple. And we can see in Malachi, they immediately were disobeying God. In fact, even before Malachi, you know, we see examples in Nehemiah, you know, where they let the work stop, you know, and, and uh, before, you know, and Haggai and Zechariah had to come along and prophesy and get them busy again. So, I mean, just Israel, they've got a long history of just disobedience and failing at, at every twist and turn of the way. So, understand these prophecies that we see in Ezekiel, they are not going, they did not come to pass in the way that they were explained and the way things were, were laid out there. Why? Because they disobeyed. They did not follow these things. They rejected the Messiah. They killed the Messiah. Now, understand, it is crystal clear. God always knew how things would play out, and it was going to be Jesus going to the cross, and it was going to be better. God always knew it was going to be the, that old covenant. It was a schoolmaster to bring him to salvation. It was to, it was to teach them about the holiness of God, and it was to point them to Jesus Christ and to the new and better covenant that Jesus came. When Jesus came at that triumphal entry, while Israel did not do anything that they were supposed to do, Jesus, if we observe him, if we put our focus on Christ, Jesus did everything to make it possible for all men to be saved. Jesus did everything himself. Jesus offered up himself as a sacrifice. He didn't purify the sons of Levi. You know what he did? But he was pure. He, he was without sin. Jesus didn't use the Levites to offer up a sacrifice to God. He offered up himself. He, he was given the role by God of that high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And so in Hebrews 9, and this is where, folks, how can you read the book of Hebrews and think a temple is coming back and to think sacrifices are coming back and that they'll be accepted by God? I understand that it is very likely that, you know, that the beast will build, have a temple built and will offer sacrifices, which would be an abomination. What we are reading in Ezekiel 40 through 48 is not an abomination. It was good. These were good and holy things. But Israel did not do those things. So this is what was brought in. And let's read this because this is what it's all about. And he, uh, Hebrews 9, 11, But Christ being come an high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle. Greater and more perfect tabernacle. Not made with hands. Not That is to say, not of this building. Folks, there's a greater and more perfect tabernacle. Better than anything that was ever supposedly behind that wall. Hey, way better than any building that could be made by hands. Jesus brought in something better. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and of the ashes of a heifer and the sprinkle of the unclean sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance for where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of the goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both upon the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you, 
Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in heaven should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world, he hath appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and to them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. And folks, I don't even know what to say. I don't even know what commentary to add. Hebrews makes it so much better. All of those things in the beginning, they were just a pattern of the things that were to come. It was always going to be Jesus. It was always going to be the new and better covenant. But understand, the Bible tells us that Israel break that first covenant. That first covenant, for them to break it, it has to have an end result, assuming they don't break it. God always knew that they would. But in, in my opinion, had they not broken that, which was impossible, then they would have built that magnificent temple and they would have used it forever. They would have offered sacrifices forever. But folks, isn't the new covenant so much better? A one-time sacrifice? It's done. It's finished. It's complete. Okay, now let's go to chapter 10. Okay, we can't ignore this stuff. And let me tell you something. If you think, let me and let me just say this. If you think Hebrews is a tribulation epistle for the Jews, you're a heretic. Okay, you're a heretic, and I doubt your salvation. Hebrews, it was 100% relevant for the Jews in that first century because they were to follow Christ without the camp. They were to accept Jesus as the Messiah. It's 100% relevant today. And anybody who thinks, now this is, you know, and anybody who teaches that Hebrews teaches you can lose your salvation is also a heretic. And I also, I don't doubt your salvation. I don't believe you're saved. If you think that Hebrews has some of the best eternal salvation verses in all the scriptures, no one ever could lose their salvation. You're a heretic. If you think that you do not understand the book of Hebrews, but let's go ahead and read and, and read some more. And the says, for the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of those things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect or complete. Okay? They did serve a purpose temporarily, but they could never finish things. The sacrifice that Christ did, it perfected it. It finished it. It was complete. The sacrifices that they did before, they would have to go on forever. It says, for then would they not have ceased to be offered. That's why these things we see in the Old Testament talk about forever. Yes, under the Old Covenant, the things would have to go on forever. They would have to keep the Passover forever. They would have to have a Levitical priesthood forever. But no, they, they would never be finished. But Jesus finished these things because the worshipers once purged should have no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again, made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not, but a body hast thou prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come. The volume of the book is written on me to do thy will, O God. Above when he saith, Sacrifice and, off and uh, burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldst not, neither hast pleasure therein which are offered by the law. Then he said, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. And, and I'm not going to take the time to go through all of Hebrews chapter 10. I really wish we could. But I love. let me just hit a few highlights. Verse 12, it says, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. You know why? Because he finished it. That's better. 
That old covenant system, the Ezekiel 40 through 48 system, that would have had to go on forever. This is better. Jesus went and he got it done and he sat down because he's finished. Verse 19, having therefore brethren boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Jesus is better. That is the theme of Hebrews. Jesus is better. Some of Hebrews, Jesus is better. You know what? Somebody says, I believe Ezekiel 40, the 48, you know, I, I believe in that temple. I don't. You know, Jesus is better. Jesus is the fulfillment of those things. What, what was to be done through the things of Ezekiel 40 through 48 were fulfilled instead through Christ in the Gospels, in his death, burial, and resurrection, and that is better. What you are looking for is inferior, and I, and I am offended when I hear people talk about this glorious temple that's going to come one of these days. It's going to be so magnificent. They're going to offer these sacrifices. They're going to do this stuff in the millennium. You're a heretic. You are trying to pull, you, you are pointing people back to the weak and the beggarly elements when Jesus brought in something that was so much better. And when you do that kind of thing and act like we got to restore the land to the Jews and help the Jews get these things and help the Jews build a temple, you are wrong and you are leading them to hell and you are contrary to the scriptures. You are contrary to the apostles. You are contrary to the writer of Hebrews who in Hebrews chapter 13 verse 10 said, we have an altar which they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. Those who are still attached to the things of the temple, the writer of Hebrews says, we have an altar that you don't have a right to. You know, they were still excluding Gentiles from the altar that was within that gate. Remember, a riot broke out in Jerusalem when they thought Paul brought a Gentile among them. A riot broke out because of that. Still keeping Gentiles out, which was against God's commands. And so understand, the writer of Hebrews... Paul, whoever it was, said, we have an altar you don't even have a right to. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought to the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore, Jesus also, okay, that he might, okay, those sacrifices they would take outside the camp that couldn't perfect us, that couldn't take away sin. But just like those sacrifices were taken outside the camp, it says, um, Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. They took him outside the gate. Listen to what he says. Let us go therefore, therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. You know what he's telling him here? Leave the temple. Leave it. We don't need it. It is, it is sad how many Christians, they go up on the fake temple mount right behind me, They'll go on the on the western wall on the opposite end. They'll pray at the wall, Lord, restore the land to Israel. Let them rebuild their temple. No. You know, give, you know, take this land away from the Muslims and give it back to the Jews. No. Hebrew says, tells them to leave it. It says to follow him without the camp, bearing his reproach. What did Jews do to Jews who were obedient and followed the Messiah outside the camp? They persecuted them. It wasn't enough that they they finally got wise and they left the temple area. They they would follow them around. They were always following the Christians. They'd follow Paul to different cities and persecute him. That was what they did. And they and but Paul he bore that reproach. And they're calling on Jews bear that reproach. You'll be hated by your family. You'll be attacked. But follow Jesus. He's better. Leave Jerusalem. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. And we have Christians today still calling Jerusalem the holy city. Still acting like Jerusalem is the center of everything and all that. No, we've left. He told us to leave. We don't have a continuing city. We seek one to come. We're looking for the new Jerusalem. That Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. That Jerusalem, God's done with it. We're looking for the new Jerusalem. 
By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. We don't offer up animal sacrifices anymore. You know what we do? We praise God. We praise Jesus. Why? Because he's the sacrifice. We, that, that, we praise him. We point to his sacrifice. We don't bring new sacrifices. No, we point back to the sacrifice that Jesus made. We praise him. We give the fruit of our lips. That's the only sacrifice that we need to do today is we point people back to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We lift up the name of Jesus and we don't care if it offends the Jews. We don't care about that. We're going to tell them the truth. They need to leave Jerusalem. They need to leave the fake Temple Mount. They need to leave the things of the law and they need to accept Jesus Christ. They need to bear his reproach. Now is the day of salvation. And if they do not get saved, they will go to hell. They will be destroyed at the return of Christ. They're not all going to be saved at the return of Christ. They will be destroyed at the return of Christ. Now is their day of salvation. And so understand what we're seeing in Ezekiel is what will be if they obey. But just like God said, they're not going to obey. God always knew they weren't going to obey. It is so crystal clear from the beginning, God knew it was going to be Jesus. Okay, The cross was not plan B, it was plan A. He is the lamb slain from the foundation of of the world. So what people are looking at in Ezekiel 40, they just, they're only cherry picking. They're not reading all of it. They're not looking at context. They're not paying attention to what happened. I'm not looking for the Messiah to go through the Eastern gate. If they open that up tomorrow and then I'm not going to get excited about that. They've done it before. It's been open before in history and sealed back up. If they open it up, they might seal it back up again for a couple hundred more years. I, I don't know. That has nothing that, that gate behind me has nothing to do with prophecy, folks. It's deception. It's all it is. It's a satanic deception. We don't need that city. Let's follow Christ without the camp, bearing his reproach. And you'll even get reproach today from Baptists. That's how, that's how deceived our world is by this antichrist beast system. And you know what? You don't need to be deceived. You don't need to be looking for these things. Jesus is better. Jesus is better better he is the fulfillment of the prophecies of israel so no no more temple of god i already showed you the new heaven and new earth too no temple why jesus is better jesus is better and so with that that, that it concludes our uh, podcast about the prophecies of ezekiel hopefully it answered any questions you might have and make sure you watch tomorrow the bonus episode specifically about the eastern gate it's important you know this, especially if you ever go to Israel, because you will be fed a bunch of baloney about that gate that's right behind me. So anyway, I appreciate everyone watching this week. Thank you for uh, doing that. Please like, subscribe, help me spread the word. Let's get the word out about these podcasts. I believe they're very needed. So thank you all. We will see you all next time.